Once again, good evening and welcome to our Friday Bible study coming to you live from the Apostolic Faith Church located here at 50 Anchor Avenue, Oceanside, New York. This is one of our midweek activities and so we enjoy you to please come along with us. If you cannot physically be here, we have the opportunity to join us online through our um, YouTube channel and we believe that God will bless you tonight. Before we go into our Bible study, we are going to rise for the opening prayer. Sister Abigail. Dear Heavenly Father, we just did. Mm -hmm. As we're going to do our Sunday school lesson, help us to understand. Mm -hmm. And as we finish our lesson, let the words inspire us and apply in our hearts. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We have been studying from the new discovery guide. <clears throat> so if you haven't have a copy of it, please ask for it. We have copies available so that we can, you know, take one and study from it. So we are looking at in this summer, we are going to be looking at First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So those are the um, Bible chapters that we are going to consider this summer 2024. So we have the booklet free. It's available in the church at the back. And if anybody online would need a copy, you can email the church and we would make one available for you. So by way of announcement, by God's grace, tomorrow morning we are going to have morning shout from 7 uh, o'clock to 7.30, by God's grace, which is our early morning prayer between 7 and 7.30. You can join us through our online number, and we believe that God will bless you as well. On the next last day, uh, Sunday school will begin at 9.30 for the those who are in search and answer classes. 9.30 will be their, the time for their Sunday school. 9.40 will be for the elementary, the children, and that will be us at 9.40. And immediately after that, by 11 o'clock, will be our devotional service. And don't forget, this coming Sunday is being declared Father's Day. So there will be Father's Day celebration after the morning service. So tonight we are looking at the third lesson in our new discovery guide. The third lesson is where we are going to look at tonight. But before then we have seen the genealogies, genealogies and David's reign, which was part one. Also David's reign, part two as found in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 from verse 1 to 17 and 27. So tonight we are looking at the third part of David's reign. Of course, we know David who happens to be uh, the king who took over after the passage of Saul. And we have seen how God has established his kingdom. So we are looking at his reign and how God has been using him tremendously in setting up, you know, uh, a godly uh, reign uh, in that uh, during the soon time. So our, our, for tonight, we are looking at First Chronicles chapter 18 from verse 1 through 26 up to verse 32. We have a key verse that's uh, associated with this uh, study tonight, and that is First Chronicles chapter 22 from verses 18 through verse 19, and we can read it along with me. It says, Is not the Lord your God with you? And hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land unto my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God, Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God unto the house that is to be built into the name of the Lord. <clears throat> That's our key verse. 
So the author of this first and second chronicles are the book we're looking at tonight, which directed its, its uh, chapters to the nation, and he wanted us to find out, the people to find out the history of the people that, you know, this is how we are going to understand God's dealing with his children. So in, his, in the focus of the writer on King David, much is not mentioned about, you know, the failures uh, of David. Instead, the author highlighted um, the strengths and the victories that God uh, gave unto David so that he can encourage uh, the children of Israel who were in exile at that time uh, so that they can, you know, uh, put their efforts together in, in rebuilding Jerusalem after their 70 years of captivity in Babylon. <clears throat> so the, the author wanted the returning Jews to remember that obedience to God will bring what? Blessing. Right, thank you, sir. It will bring God's blessing. He wanted them to know that. Equally, he wanted them to know that <clears throat> to make the temple and the priesthood, which is God's ordained form of worship, a priority. You know, they have been away for almost 70 years in a foreign land. So he wanted them to, re he wanted to re energize them in their commitment to their worship of their God. And lastly, also, <clears throat> the author also wanted to believe that God's promises, God's unconditional promises to them, God has already made covenant with them, and that promise is unconditional. Yes, it's unconditional, and God has laid it for them. So this is what the writer wanted these people to know. So our text today, from 18 to 26, is divided into three parts. What we are looking at tonight is divided into three parts. Chapters 18 to 20 in that one, that summarizes the military victories that God gave unto David, right? I gave unto him to the extent that everyone around them, around him at that time, he subdued them, right? And they became tributaries to David. It wasn't by his effort, it was by God's power that he has done that for him. So that's one thing that we're going to see. Uh, and, that, and that resulted in the enhancement of David's reputation in Israel and also the neighboring nations, the fear, the fear God of Israel. Chapter 21, in that chapter, that was where the sin of David and the, and the following tragedy was recorded. We're going to see that after he had been warned May God help us. Yes. After he had been won by his captains, not just only Joab, you see, they warned him, you see, but you see, there is a reason why God leaves this for us. God, God, there's a reason why God put every record in the Bible for us. And I pray for myself, and I pray for all of us, Amen. that we don't fall into the same fit, fit, uh, problem after God has shown us example. And we're going to see it in this lesson. And, and, and also, we God help our leaders. Amen. Yeah, because when somebody says something, you, you go, you're going to see, that place really struck me. Uh, the, he decided, he changed the advice, the warning. Well, of course, he was the king, right? So the, son, the captain cannot do anything. Yes. So we got help us. So we're going to see that, you see. And, 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 and the Bible scholars, you know, and the, they suggested that this event was included in this, in this account because of the significance of the land that was bought for that sacrifice. It's because on that land was the temple built. So, and chapters 22 to 26, we have a record of how David arranged, the arrangement of David made for the building of what? Of the temple. Not only that, and also how he made, uh, uh, the, 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 how he organized the worship of God. He set everything in, in place, right from the, uh, the, the priest to, to, the, to, the, to the potters. Everybody, he put them in place. So this God is a God of what? Order. That's right. 
Look at that time. And God helped him to set everything in place. Everybody know their position. Everybody know what to do in the house of God. So I pray that as we look into this lesson, that God of heaven will speak to our hearts. We are studying this lesson for what? For us to, be, to benefit from it, isn't it? Yes. It's not to think, it's not history. We are not in the history class. The, the Bible says all these things happen unto them. As what? As an example. Because the same God is the one we are worshipping today. Huh? It's the same God. If God will confront King uh, David, the, if he confront David, the man after his own heart, and told him that I put three things before you, <laughs> there is no one that is, that is fear in all the three. So may God come and help us. We are dealing, we are serving the same God. I think this lesson will be a caution to me, to all of that. God is no respecter of persons. It's no respecter of persons. So, we are, look, we are going to begin looking at uh, chapter, chapter 18. <clears throat> and the first thing we're going to see in that chapter 18 is God's covenant with David was included in that promise that Israel's enemy will be what? Subdued. Isn't it? Yes. God has already made that promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 17, verse 9. God has already made that promise for David. Okay? But in chapter 18, he shows to us how God fulfilled that promise for David by helping him to defeat all those opposing nations that surrounded Israel. You see, it's not, only, it's not now that, that Israel has been surrounded with enemies. It's not now. It has been happening from time memorial. But the promise of God, nothing can move it away. Yeah, nothing can defeat his purpose. So, and, and then, and then let's, uh, let's read chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 18, verses 8 and 11. Chapter 18, verses 8 and 11. <clears throat> it says, do you want to read? Quickly, one. thank you. 8 and 11. Yes. Okay. Likewise, from Tibat and from Shon, cities of Hezerezah, brought David very much brass, wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass. 11. 11. Then, also king, then also King David dedicated unto the Lord with the silver and the gold that he brought from all these nations, from Edom and from Moab, and from the children of Amno, Ammon, and from the Philistines, and from Amalek. Before you sit down, go to verse 1. Verse because one. that is the result of what happened in the preceding verses. Okay. Go to verse 1 now. Now, after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines, mm -hmm. and subdued them, and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 2. And he smote Moab, and the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. Verse 3. And David smote Hadareza, king of Zobah, unto the hammer, and he went to, to establish his dominion by the river Ephrates. Verse 4. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven thousand horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. David also bought all the chariots horses but reserve of them and hundred chariots. Thank you. You can see defeat upon defeat. If you continue to read because of time, if you go up to verse 7, David, even the Syrians came. People gathered together to fight them. And what did God do? God gave them, gave him what? Victories. To the extent that everything, they have a great spoil. Isn't it? That's what we read in verses uh, 8 and uh, 11. They had a great spoil from, from, from the defeat of their enemy. But our lesson is asking us, what did David do with the wealth that, he, that was able to gather from these enemies that God helped him to defeat? What did he do with them? He, them to God. He, he, he dedicated them to, to who? God. To God. To the extent that we are told that the brass was used by who? Solomon. To do what? To build. To build, to construct the, 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 the temple. You see? 
There are lessons for, for us here to learn. You see, David could have thought that, oh, this, this world was the result of my what? Military might. Isn't it? Yes. After all, I, 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 I fought and I won. It should be mine, mine, mine. But the Bible tells me all good gifts comes from who? Come from God above. That's right. That's right. So, thank God for that. For that, you see, you see. And our lesson is now warning us that it's possible for us too <laughs> that at times <laughs> we may be tempted to assume that <laughs> our financial and material blessing is because of our own efforts. Isn't it? Remember that man. He said, "Is this not, is this not what Babylon that I build with what?" That's right. If God will just remove a strand of your ear eh, and you have a headache, you won't be able to build that, uh, I mean, that house or that, uh, that kingdom. So this lesson is telling us that we should remember that all good things come from God and they should be returned to who? Back to God. That's right. Back to God. Eh? So we want to remember that God is the source of all our blessing in this life. God is the source of our world. Our blessing. That is nothing we have that was not what? Given to us. So we saw the, David give us an example. He went, he fought. You know, it's because of time, he couldn't read. Look at all the nations around him. The children of Israel are always few among their enemies. But they will always defeat their enemies. Am I right? Yes. So, look, look if you have victory today, it's not because of your proudness. It's not because you are smart. It is, it's not because of your strength. And may God have mercy on us. You know, that's how the devil will come in. Eh? And he can sow the seed of what? Pride. That's right. He can sow the seed of pride in us. And we feel, we feel big. <laughs> may we not feel big because, before God. We feel big. And we saw David here. You see, so David gave us an example that, you know, God is the one that gave me victory. So all these things, all this were <laughs> overnight, <laughs> he became a millionaire. Allow me to use that word, isn't it? Yes. He had a lot. And he said, no. I said, may God give us vision. Amen. You see, that man already had a vision. And you will see it. He already had a vision. So all these things, no. Dedicated to, for God. Eh? Because in the future, something was coming up. Yeah, the temple, uh, yeah, the temple was coming up. You don't know why God has blessed you today? You don't know what God has, why God has blessed you today. It may be because of a project that's a coming, up, coming up. May God give us a vision. Amen. So let's look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, So David reigned over all Israel and executed what? Judgment and justice among his people. The question there is this. What are some of the ways our leader, a leader could execute judgment and justice. You see, our lesson tried to dis uh, define for us what, is, what does it mean to execute. Execute is translation of the Hebrew word asa, A-S-A-H, which means accomplished, appointed. And judgment comes from the word mispat, which means verdict or ordinance. Justice comes from the word tadakash, meaning rightness, moral attitude. So with that explanation now, what are some of the ways a leader could execute judgments and justice in our day? That was what the Bible, see, the Bible says it about David, that he executed judgment and what? And justice. In other words, he did what was what? Right. What was right? He did what was right. So a leader who executes judgment and justice will be guided by who? God. By God. That's right, by God. Do we have responsibility to pray for our leaders? Yes. That's right. That we may spend our life in what? In peace. So a leader who executes judgment and justice will be guided by God it will treat individuals with what? Without what? Without partiality. Thank you, sir. Without partiality. That's right. Without partiality. 
Whether it's his body or it's not his body. That's right. And, 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 and as it goes for the leader in the government, so it goes for the leader where? In the house of God. In the home. That's right. A leader who, 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 who executes judgment and justice will be fear in his ruling. <laughs> Our lesson says he will not accept what? Bribe. Because bribe will do what? It will, that's, that's it. It will blind you. That's right. He will not accept bribe. Huh? And it will be concerned. His concern will be the interest of who? Of, who? of the people. Not to line his pocket. Is that not what we are lacking? That is what is lacking in many nations today. That's right. That is why this word, you see, <laughs> ah, may God help us. Oh, uh, godliness, godliness is the only thing that can promote a nation. If what we saw here, if what David, the attribute, what we are talking about, David, if it uh, is happening in all nations of the world, you know, this world will be a peaceful place. It will be a peaceful place. And you, you see what's happening here? What I can gather here? The leader set the tone. Am I right? The leader set the tone. If he, as a leader, as a king of the nation, if he has all this in his, in his, in his, in his, in his ruling, in the way he rules, who are, who are you to be under him and do something less? Is, is, is he not the one who appoints those who are working with him? Yeah. <laughs> you, you expect that those who are working with him, they will not be what? They will not be corrupt. There will be fear, isn't it? Yes. So the leaders set the tone. So we need to pray for our leaders in our nation today as well. And other parts of the world as well. And you see, uh, 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 let this lesson says, that principles of a good leader who executes justice and judgment, that principle of good and just leadership, it says, <laughs> it will look the same in every era and culture. It doesn't matter whether it was in the 15th century or 14th century or 20th, 21st century. It doesn't matter the culture, whether it's in India or it's in, in, in China. It does not matter. Godliness is godliness. Righteousness is, is righteousness. Irrespective of the era and, and culture. I, I had a preacher. He was... He was talking about dressing. Uh, you, you come to church and dress, and then he was, he was talking about you know the way people dress in the church. He said, he said once you get saved, he said you change your culture. He said once you get saved, he said I don't care whether you are from this place or that place. He said once you get saved, you change your culture. What culture do you have? Culture of heaven. Culture of holiness. Culture of righteousness. So if we have to rule right, to do the right thing, eh? it must be rooted in our relationship with God. And David did it, and, and that's what we saw in the life of David. Did God bless him? Did God bless his reign? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I said, these people set example for us. Uh, is verse 14 says that said, it means that David administered the affairs of his kingdom in a righteous manner. In a, ma in a righteous manner. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. We have to pray for our nation. I'm telling you the truth. We have to pray for our nation. That righteousness will rule and reign. Chapter 19. In chapter 19, which, <laughs> you see, you know the story of chapter 19. <clears throat> and it came to pass after the, after that, Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died. And his son reigned in his, and his son reigned instead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Nahon, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So what did he do? David now sent messengers to him. You see? 
you, you, I just want to replicate, you know, I just want to show kindness to you because your father was kind to my father. But, but when he did that, he treated, his, 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 the, the servant or the messengers of David were treated with contempt. We are told that they shave them, isn't it? They make them to be ashamed. So they said that they cannot come into the city. And, and then, and because of that, our lesson says that actions were equivalent to declaring a war. So David sent out his army of mighty men to confront the Ammonites, to confront their forces. Now, who will tell me the leader, the commander in chief? I mean, the, yeah, the commander in chief of David's army at this time. Joab. Joab. Thank you, sir. Joab was the commander in chief, you know, but and Joab has troops, isn't it? He? he has troops, and now the battle is ahead of them. And our lesson says that uh, Joab made a short but significant speech to the Israelite forces. That's the lesson we want to learn now. He made, because they, they don't know the outcome of the, of the war, isn't it? But they have their leader. We are going to see now. We have a leader. May God give us wonderful leaders. They have a leader who made a short but significant speech. See? What did he say to encourage them? This is a battle that they may go and not what? And not come back. That's right. And, and, and the integrity of the nation depends on who? On them. Okay. So, what did he say to encourage them? And what was the outcome of the battle? Verse 13. It's the encouragement. Sister Blackwell. Go to the mic, ma'am. Told them to be of good courage. Be of good courage. Um, Read on. No, oh, it's, not, it's not finished. <laughs> and it says, be of good courage and let us behave ourselves valiantly for our people and for the cities of our God. Mm -hmm. And let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. Thank you. It was a short but powerful speech. Powerful. Short but powerful speech. And our lesson says, that be of good courage means indicate that courage is a matter of choice. Yes. May God help us. There is nobody who will see a battle that will not be afraid. Yes. There is nobody who will see a battle that will not be afraid. You remember they told those people, they said, anybody who is afraid, let them go back. That's right. But this man came out to encourage his people. I need your courage. I mean, encouragement. You need my encouragement, isn't it? Yes, because we are on, we are on a battle. Are we not? We are on a, every day we fight a battle. <laughs> I say every day we fight a battle. Yes, the enemy you don't see. You fight him every day. May God have mercy on me. That I will not come to church and add to your problem. That's right. See, he said, be of good courage. Our lesson says God, God makes his strength available. But he's telling them, be of good courage. God is there to do what? To help you. Yeah. And he went on to say, let us behave ourselves valiantly for our God and for the city of our world. God. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he, he was telling the army to consider the consequences of failure. In other words, this thing we are doing, there is no room for what? We are not failing. No error. Yeah, no error. By the grace of God, our focus is that we are going to make heaven. By God's grace. Encourage them. <laughs> yes, encourage them. <laughs> he said, if they, were over, if, if they were overcoming battle, they will lose both their people and their city. Something is at stake for you and I. I, I we must not fail. I said, we must not fail. Something's at stake. Then he was telling them, your city is at stake. Am I right? The name of your God is what? It's at stake too. 
Our lesson says, look at what our lesson says. It said, this is a reminder that our attitude and action will have an impact on others. When they hear that, when they hear that, right, from their, from their uh, commander, Sister Blackwell, what would be the attitude? They, they were encouraged, they were strengthened. They were, they were fired up. They were, they were Isn't it? Yeah, they were fired up. <laughs> if our leader is talking like this, in other words, in their heart, the battle is already what? It's won. That, that's right. May, may, may we be encouragement to each other. Amen. Encourage them. Encourage them. And then, lastly, he said, let the Lord do that which is good in his what? Sight. Sight. They committed everything into whose hand? God's into God's spirit. hand. That's right. <laughs> eh? This God, is, our God is great. Amen. Yeah, our God is powerful. So he's telling them, Eh? Even if anybody among them is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is afraid, but once he introduced this mighty God of Israel, the strength of Israel that does not fail, they know that God, the battle is already won. So there's a real comfort in knowing that God is always in control. So if you are facing battle today too, if you are facing situation today too, no matter how difficult the situation may seem before us, God is in what? He's in control. Might, the, the mountain might, might be greater or higher than Kilimanjaro. Don't worry. God is on the throne. That's right. And God has never lost a battle before. So, they were encouraged. And when they were encouraged, our lesson says, there was an outcome. Isn't it? Yes, there was an outcome. Remember, remember, remember that man of God that said he wanted to die, and, he, and, and God sent food to, for, for him yeah. and gave him food to eat, isn't it? He went in the strength of that food for how long? 40 days. 40 days. So there was an outcome after being encouraged. That's where I'm going. Yeah. There was an outcome after being encouraged. And we see that in verse 15 of this place that we read. To the extent that God, in his power, in his mercy, he gave them what? He gave them victory. Thank you, sir. He gave them victory. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were, were fled, they likewise fled before Abishai, his brother, and entered into the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. So God gave them complete victory over their enemies. But that, that victory started from where? From the encouragement of their leader. That's right. From the encouragement that was given to them by their leader. The outcome of the battle was victory for Israel. You see, the Amorites retreated to the original city. The Syrian mercenary that they have hired. <laughs> you see, they have hired them. <laughs> when they saw the defeat, what did they do themselves? They fled. <laughs> yeah, they fled. They fled. You see? Yeah? And ultimately, they made peace with the children of Israel. You know, some of them became tributaries. You see, it, it, the point is this: Can you imagine? I don't know whether it was in a room or in a uh, uh, under their hall. hall. I don't know where their leader spoke to them, but the point is this: Their victory started from the mouth of their leader. Yeah. I'm telling you, this, what, their victory was from the mouth of their leader. The, the leader already spoke victory out. And they were encouraged by the leader. May God continue to help us. Help our leader as well. Let's proceed to chapter 21. Now, that's a great lesson for us to learn in this chapter 21. <clears throat> Verse 3, Abigail. Verse 3 of chapter 21. Quickly. So, and Joab answered the Lord, make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doeth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Thank you very much. Before, that was uh, Joab's response to what uh, David said to him in verse 2. David told him in verse 2 to, to go and do what? 
and number Israel from Bathsheba even unto Dan. And then bring the number to me. Our lesson says that it's possible that, you see, when I was looking at the lesson, I said, you see, whatever is in our heart comes through our action. Our action. Whatever is in your heart, you demonstrate it through your action. Don't forget that in the, in the preceding chapter with 19, they just had victory, isn't it? So David could be thinking that this victory was as a result of what? His power. The pa power the people I have, my military strength, the number of people. And, and, and Joab told him, may God have mercy on us. <laughs> Some, most times, or sometimes, God will not come down from heaven physically to warn us. He can use my sister to warn me. May God have me, mercy on me that I will hear. Yeah, he can use my brother to warn me. He warned him. He told him. He said, even, apart from that, he told him the consequence. No, it, this thing will become what? It, become, it will become a cause and a trespass. But our lessons, you say, <laughs> we are told that there is a parallel account in Second Samuel chapter twenty-four, verse four, that said that captains of the army. So it wasn't only Joab. Other other captains of the army, they told him the same thing. However, David went ahead. That's the problem we are looking at now. He said, however, David went ahead with the censors. And his actions had their consequences. Since verse 1 indicates that Satan incited David into taking the censor. Why do you think David was held responsible? <laughs> why? Ma? Okay, he was, he was, he was you know, the leader. You know, you should know better than that. He was the leader. He yes. It. Sir? Oh, he initiated it. He initiated it. <laughs> God is no respecter of persons, whether you are the king or you are the servant. I have some notes here. I said, though David was one, but knowingly, he knowingly went against God's will. Knowingly. He went against God's will. See, God will always send warning, isn't it? Yes, He will always send warning. Man has the right to make a choice. Even after God has warned you, you have the right. We are not created as robots. You, have the, you can make a choice. God will not force Himself on you. God doesn't force His will on man. Our actions show what is inside of us. And lastly, Sin is a willful action. It's, a, it's something you willfully want to do. That's right. That's what he did here. That's what he did. And that's why, and you know what? Another lesson we are learning here is, is this. Every one of us, we are accountable to God. No matter your situation, no matter your position in life, even the president of this country is accountable to God. Everybody is accountable to God. Nobody can say I'm too big for God to, 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 to speak to. Huh? So our lesson wants us to know that there is a difference between temptation and sin. See? Temptation is not what? Sin. It's not sin. You see? Because the lesson says, uh, you see, if you are tempted, eh? if you are tempted, you don't have to sin. Isn't it? Somebody was tempted and did not commit sin. Huh? Thank you. He was, he was tempted. He didn't commit sin. Isn't it? Our Lord and Savior was tempted in all ways. But he never committed any sin. Adam and, Adam and, Adam and Eve, they were tempted. What did they do? They fell. So there's a difference between temptation and sin. But man has a choice. And look, look. <laughs> If you if you if you if you if you if you make a choice, I pray you make the right choice. Mm -hmm. David here did not make the right choice, and his action result into a dear consequence. You see another thing we see here: David was not only the one who suffered the consequence. Before you wink your we wink our eyes. How many thousands have died? Seventy thousand of people have died. Those who have they have no business. 
Does that tell me that my action can discourage or encourage somebody? Yes. yes. Somebody might say, okay, if that is, may God have mercy. I don't pray anybody will take this decision. That, oh, if that's, the, if that's the way, I leave the church. Because of somebody's action, 70,000 innocent people, they just perish overnight. And God came to him and said, okay, I saw what you did. You know, I told you, everyone is accountable to God. And God said, okay, because you did that, huh? Okay, I put two, three things before you. Choose one of them. Three years of famine. Even, isn't it? Three years of famine. That will cause death in Israel, isn't it? <laughs> You're talking about 70,000. 70, before you open your eyes, oh, triple, quadruple that number is already de dead. Because say three years. Three years. Huh? It was <laughs> uh, Jacob and his children. They have not gone through one first year when they ran out of their <laughs> they ran out of their land, isn't it? Yes. So then, well, some people will survive that. The wealthy, right? And 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 possibly David, you know, because he was a king. The second one: three months of defeat at the hands of your of your enemies. Who will be mostly affected about that? Will not be soldiers? Yeah. That's it. Then three days of pestilence at the hand of at the hand of God. Ah. Then David said, okay, if that one is in the hand of God, then I better do what? I, I better choose that. Huh? Because it's, it's full of what? Mercy. It's full of mercy. Yeah, it's full of mercy. You see? Mm. What we see here is <laughs> may God help us. May God help us. You see, when, when I was looking at this lesson, I said, that same God who made out uh, judgment yeah. is the same God who has mercy in his hand. Amen. Can you see this God? The same God that will make out a judgment to you at, his, at, his, at the same hand is stretching out mercy. Yes. Can you see how this great this God is? Yeah. No wonder the Bible says God is so interested in the death of anybody. Amen. That's right. So we, so so so, you know what's going to avert the judgment of the judgment of God upon us? Is what? It's repentance. Because this David, what did he do? He cried out to God. He said, he told uh, that, uh, what's the prophet's name? He said, he said, he said, he said, uh, uh, he said, I am in a street. Uh, yes. Uh, God. In verse 13, he said, David said unto God, I am in a great strait. <laughs> Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercy. But let me not fall into the hand of man. Man doesn't have mercy. No. He doesn't have mercy. You do it now, man is ready to kill you on the spot. But, but this, the God who said three things, eh? choose one. That same God, he said, I would rather fall because he has what? He has mercy. May the mercy of God avail for us tonight. Yeah. That mercy is still available tonight. No matter your condition, no matter what you find yourself, just cry out unto God and it will have mercy. You will have mercy. So, uh, God has answered prayer even in time of failure, distress, punishment, and hopelessness. Isn't it? Look at Samson. Isn't that the same thing? Samson, in that distress, in that condition, he cried unto God. Eh? And God have mercy. Manasseh, Manasseh, that this abomination, you can't describe the abomination that he committed, but God show mercy on him. So, now, David is coming to, we are coming to closer in chapter, in chapter 22 now. <clears throat> we saw that uh, uh, the prophet now told David to set, you see, another thing that God did again. God instructed him what to do. You see, you see, you see this great God, eh? after he has realized that, ah, I have no option but to fall to this hand of God. God now told the man of God, God, go and tell him what to do. You see, God is the one that set exam and also give you all the joke. Yeah. Yes, he set the exam and tell you, read this chapter and, this, and that chapter and you will pass. What a great God we serve. That's right, he's a merciful God. You see, he said, he said, and, and, and the prophet instructed uh, David to set up an altar 
and sacrifice to the Lord on the threshing floor of honor. That was God told, he told him there because that's what God wanted. That was what was going to appease God. And then, so he did that. Chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles records David's preparation for building the temple. What natural materials did David, the King David gather for the purpose? Huh? What did he gather? That's if you look at uh, chapter 22 from verse 3 to 4 and 14. He, he, he gather what? He gather iron. He gather brass. Cedar wood, isn't it? Gold and silver. Brass, iron, India. So the Bible said that uh, they cannot be weighted again. In other words, there were too many. Yeah, there were too many. He made them so abundant. He said, yeah, he made them so, so much abundant that, that, that they cannot, he said, he said in verse 3, the last portion of verse 3 says, and brass in abundance without weight. So those things were what? Were too many. Now, remember that this man, he will not build that temple. He will not build that temple. But look at what he did. What are the lessons we are going to learn from here? Yes? Support others in the work of God. Isn't it? Support. Do not strive for position. You want to say something, sir? Do not strive for position. I want to be seen. I want to be the one. If you, if you want to be seen, the Bible says you already have your reward. That's right. If you do something for God and you boast about it, what are you? What are you going to do? Look, look at look at what this man did single-handedly. I, I I don't know whether uh, historians or archaeologists have been able to quantify the value of what David provided. When you say somebody provided something that you cannot wait, in other words, they can't. They, they broke the weight. That was that means it was provided well more than they needed. So. Our destiny want to know that want us to know that we can whatever you can do to assist others. When God called him, when God called her, may God help me to support him. Amen. Yeah, ah, they should have given it to me. I know how to do it better. What is that? Pride. Pride. That's pride. Man, we should not strive for position in God's house in order to gain notice or commendation from others. <laughs> people can look. People can say a lot of these good things about you. But what does God say about you? If you do that thing, so that it can be seen, so that I can gain, gain the favor of people. You do it, you can pump money into God's business, and then because you know you are doing it for yourself. God doesn't, it's not acceptable before God. It's not. He said, then he said, we should be content and happy to offer whatever help we can, even if it is in behind the sin role. Behind the scene. You know that David was not alive when they were building the ark. But everything that, you, you, you see, I, I don't know how to explain. May God come and explain it to us. David was not alive when they were building the ark. But you know that that ark was built to the glory of God. Because somebody has a vision to provide in abundance. We can say that it was the man behind the scene. Uh, uh, chapter 21, I'm uh, sorry, 23. In chapter 23, now David, you see, not only that, David began to organize. I, I just pray God to help me, to help all of us to have the Spirit of God in us. Look at this man. Look at this one. He, he said, it, it appears he already conceived the idea of, of honoring God in his mind. And he knew that he was not going to do it, but he was setting everything in order. Because we are told here in chapter 23, opens by stating that David was old and he made Solomon uh, the king. Is, isn't it? Yes. Then he called together the priests, huh? the, the princes and Levites, and defined how worship was to be conducted and by whom it was to be administered. He knew that young man was novice. Isn't it? He didn't say, uh, uh, they put him there. Uh, let's see what he's going to do. No, he, he, he put him there, they put him there, but his father began to put things in place so that this young man can what? Can succeed. Look, 
Look, if, 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 may God help us. If we have the, we, the mind that it's all about God, you will support it. Yes, if it's all about God. But if you are saying, me, 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 it's about me. You want it to be destroyed, may God have mercy on you. So, so in verse 30, David instructed them to stand. You know, now he's talking about to the Levites and everybody. To stand, be present every morning to thank and praise the Lord and, 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 and likewise at evening. David already told, is telling them how to approach God. Eh? He knows what God needs. Praise and what? Thanksgiving. He told them to do it <laughs> both in the morning and in the evening. What do you think is implied by, this, by that instruction? You see, David viewed David view the worship of God every morning and evening that it is very important. If you are an occasional worshiper of God, you cannot experience the power of God. Yes, if you are an occasional worship, you know, I was listening today to Brother Shikaba's encounter with, uh, with Jesus. Huh? When they came back from heaven, the angel told him, this very 5 a.m., that is the time you used to have your what? Worship. Ah. Then the angel said, open to uh, him 20. I was wondering in my mind, how did the angel know number 20? That's it. In other words, what is it, when you wake up in the morning and you are doing your devotion, everyone knows you are there. That's right. Everyone knows. So God wants us to worship him. Whether it's the time that is convenient or not, we must give him praise. That's what he was telling the Levites. He was telling the priests. He was telling everybody. He was showing them the, 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 the importance of daily worship. And because if we do that, he will draw us closer unto who? Unto God. Unto God. Our lesson says, listen, he said, why spontaneous prayers are, are certainly acceptable to God? We want to plan regular times to come before God. Regular time. Is it not David that says it? At morning, evening, and night. Isn't it? Yes. Look at uh, uh, the man in the... Daniel. They knew that every time he would do what? He would pray. May our service to God not be uh, uh, spontaneous or occasional or when it is convenient. So David told them, look, this is, what, this is how to worship God. You must do this, you must do that. And you must do it on an ongoing basis. You don't do it uh, two weeks and you stop. You don't do it two days and you stop. No. He was telling them that. Then he didn't only, David did not only define the, the mode of worship, he also told them about the orderliness of worship. And that's what we find in chapter 24. David appointed descendant of Aaron, the first priest of Israel, to serve as, as who? As priest in the temple. You see, he was he already set everything in motion. He set them up. They were then and they were separated into 24 groups that will participate in a rotational basis, orderliness, in God's house, serving every two week shifts. Can you imagine? This man already, he knew, he knew that Solomon was, was a novice, he was a young man, right? But his father already put everything in place. May God give us good mentors in the church. So, and, and then, uh, verse 19 of that, verse 24, verse 19 of verse 24, what does it say? Uh, verse 24, verse 19. It says, they were the, uh, these were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord, According to their manner, under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded them. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you see? <laughs> so what, what phrase in verse 19 stands out to you as being especially significant? Ordering of them in their service, orderliness. That, that place, I, uh, that, that encounter with Jesus and that brother today that I was listening to, Jesus Christ said, in my house. They were doing all these things. When we come to this place, God is here. The, uh, there must be orderliness in his house. There is a way the ministers march in. When we come to church, what is the first thing we do? We kneel down to what? To pray. 
There is a time the choir will sing. There is a time the congregation will sing. Orderliness. In God's house. If there is orderliness in God's house, what do you expect to happen? The Spirit of God will be there. Am I right? Yes, the presence of God will be there. God is not an author of, it's not an author of what? Confusion. He will not stay there when there is confusion. But there is orderliness. The next thing that happened in that brass is that as the Lord God commanded, the, uh, isn't it? As God has commanded through their leader. Yes. So they were following in the command of God. <laughs> we are looking at the importance of obedience to God's word. Whatever God says we should do, we must do it as God has said. I mean, when Moses, when Moses was building the ark, I'm sorry, when um, Noah was building the ark, he would say he, he, he did it as God has told him. Isn't it? The same thing with Moses. When he was building the, uh, um, what, uh, when he was instructing them on, on, on how to build the ark, I mean, the ter ter uh, tabernacle, the same thing. You, you give, give them instruction. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Everybody, they were doing it as God has instructed them. They will not do it in our own way. Amen. Yes, as the Lord God commanded. The instruction we have passed down to them. You see, God passed it down to, to their leader, Moses. He passed it to them, and they were following it. Now, after, he, he, you see, those are the priests, right? He went to the Levite as well. Isn't it? That's in chapter 25. <laughs> he, he organized the Levite too to be taking turn. In fact, we are told that they will cast what? They will cast lots. There is a reason why they have to cast lots. Because there are some who are more talented than the other. There are some who are senior and some are junior. But they want everybody to be part of the service of God. That's right. God, God, God wants everybody to be involved. So they will cast lots. So that, so that everybody is involved. You see, our lesson says here that, that that will ensure that the worship assignment were not allocated to the most talented. Nor were they based on seniority, family history. No. Or, pre, or prestige. No. No. God did the choosing. And this method provided both a protection against pride. You see, that's what they said for them. On a rotated, rotational basis. You know, God values whatever we do in his house. Yes. Isn't it? Yes, he does it. He values it. And the last set of people, they are the potters. Who are the potters? The gatekeepers. Huh? Isn't it? Yes, the gatekeepers. What do we call them today? What are you doing? Security. In the church. Ushers. Ushers. They stand by the gate. They open the door. Isn't it? Yes. They open the door. And you know what? The Bible says they were called in verse 12. He said, he said they were minister to minister in the house of God. Huh. Who is a minister? It's a servant. We are called to what? Called to serve. If you see these people, you will think that they were doing a menial job. They were supposed to make sure that people come into the house of God clean. Yes. The everything that's supposed to be done, you do it right. They were, be, uh, they were the ones who will account for the gift and sacrifices. Everything is in order. They know their duty. And they were there. They stand at the door. They open the door. They close the door. I believe they will be the last person to leave the temple. Oh, yeah. And the, the Bible says to minister. So they were minister for God. Don't you know that you too, God values your work for him? God, you may not stand behind the pulpit. You may, be, you may be like those who are taking care of the charge of the widows. Right? Yes. If you are taking charge of the widows or you are, you are watching the children in the children's hall, while the service is going on there, there is otherness in God's house. You know, the blessing is going to be yours. May God help us that all this that we have learned today, that God will help us to put them in practice. That a day is coming too. Now David is gone. But we are reading things about him. Yeah. We are reading things about him. When the glory of God came. I think we are going to see it. When the glory of God filled the temple. Was David there? Was not there. But was the will of God accomplished? That's right. May God come and help us. In Jesus mighty name.
Shortly now we are going to end, and then we'll be the time for the prayer. We want everybody to join us. Uh, Brother Biodu, give us a closing prayer, sir. Eternal God, we thank you for the word of life that you have sent across our way. Yes. Lord, you are a holy God, yes. and you want us to be holy. Yes. And so, Lord, we ask you, Father, we plead your name, that you will come and cleanse us, Amen. that you will come and help us Amen. as you help David. Amen. I put your love in our heart, Amen. because it is that love that made him to make all these preparations O oh Lord, ahead of time. And so, Lord, help us to prepare, O oh Lord God, for your coming. Yes. Jesus, come and help us. Amen. As we are going to pray, please, O oh Lord Almighty Father, examine us. Amen. This we ask you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.